Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and hello everyone. I hope everyone is feeling good. This is IMK 2 to 1 food ingredients and in this lesson I'll be talking about the classification of different types of gums or food hydrocolloids based on the source of the raw material from which source we extract the hydrocolloid and also based on the functional properties. So I'll be using this mind map here so that we can see in the, the big picture how the different types of uh, food hydrocolloids are classified. So we can uh, we will start from uh, this point. So we can see that um, hydrocolloids can be obtained from the plant source and from the animal source. But majority of the food hydrocolloids that we discuss or the application in uh, food industry is from the plant source. And from the plant, we can extract hydrocolloids from seed, from seaweed, from tuber, from sap or exudate, and also from a cellulose derivative, which is a form of chemically derived or the, the natural cellulose that has been uh, process uh, chemically and let's see from from the seed uh, we have locust bean gum and uh, we also have another one uh, gua gum actually then from seaweed we have agar we have alginate we have carrageenan so these are the three common examples of hydrocolloids extracted from seaweed then we have from tuber so from tuber we have starch which is the most common types of um, biopolymers or hydrocolloid which we use in the food industry but we don't discuss about starch in this IMK221 because we because starch is actually it's a very important uh, type of hydrocolloid so we cover starch in another course which is IMK421 technology product primer and uh, the, the starch can be further classified into cereal type or into tuber legume root and uh, from pump and another type of hydrocolloid from tuber is conjac okay and another type of uh, the plant based hydrocolloid uh, is uh, the, hydro the hydrocolloid uh, extracted from uh, from tree yeah? uh, which is in the form of sap or exudate the common example in this uh, this group is acacia or uh, arabic arabic gum and the, another group from the plant source is from cellulose derivative. This is basically the natural cellulose which has been chemically modified. And we have several examples of this. The, com the most common one that we use in uh, food application are uh, carboxyl methyl cellulose or CMC and also hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose or HPMC. Okay, so these are the different types of hydrocolloid or gums which we extract from plant. Okay, and from animal source, there are not many examples of hydrocolloid which we use commonly in the food industry or in food application. But the, but the most common one and in fact a very very special hydrocolloid because uh, here gelatin. Gelatin has many unique and special properties and it's very hard actually to find substitute for gelatin from, from the plant source. Uh, the issue because uh, the, the, we want the food industry now are looking for uh, halal gelatin but um, still we, we find it very difficult to substitute gelatin with plant hydrocolloids. And um, we also have, uh, we consider from also the hydrocolloids from microbial source. The most common one is uh, xanthan and, och and the other one is cardolan gum. But xanthan is perhaps is the most common example of hydrocolloids from microbial source. So there you are, the classification of different types of gums or hydrocolloid that we commonly use in food industry. And there are many more, but uh, these are some common ones 
and in each group here, for example, um, hydrocolloid from seed, locus wind gum, guar gum. So these are the two very very common types of hydrocolloid that we use in the food industry. So we need to learn more the properties, the functional properties of uh, locus wind gum or LBG, and also guar gum, and from seaweed, agar, alginate, carrageenan. From tuber, it's conject. Starch will be covered in, the, in different course. Then we have gum arabic uh, or gum acacia as the example of hydrocolloids from sap or exudate. And this also find uh, large application in the food industry and also cellulose derivative. Then um, we can also classify uh, hydrocolloids based on their functional properties especially uh, in terms of the gelling property so you can see here the gelling property of gums or hydrocolloids first we have to understand that uh, not all gums or not all hydrocolloids can form gel so we can divide into two groups here those that can form gel so we call it gelling type and the other one is the non-gelling type which means that they cannot form gel even at high concentration they can only form a very viscous solution so this type the non-gelling type are typically used for viscosity you know we, we use them as a viscosifying agent and mainly in the application as a stabilizer to stabilize uh, the emulsion yeah to get a long-term stability during storage so in terms of the gelling uh, type or the gelling agent, those hydrocolloids that can form gel, they can be further divided into a uh, so-called thermoreversible, thermoirreversible, require cations to gel, and uh, some can gel on cooling and some can gel on heating. So thermoreversible means uh, when one, once the gel is formed, for example, we have here, agar, gelatin, and carrageenan, they can form gel. But once they form the gel, we can still actually um, kind of uh, reverse, and and we can heat up. We can heat up the gel uh, up, you know, above the certain temperature, and then it can actually uh, melt again. Then when we cool it down, it can form gel again, and we can repeat the process. So this is what we call uh, thermal reversible or thermally reversible and we have the example here agar gelatin and carrageenan then the thermo irreversible is the opposite means that once it forms gel and that's it it's kind of like thermo set you know cannot be uh, you know uh, reverse again and in this category we have alginate and high methoxyl pectin are the two common examples and some hydrocolloids require gel uh, sorry require uh, certain condition uh, to form a gel. For example, uh, kappa carrageenan and alginate, they require cations to form a gel. Alginate would require uh, mainly calcium, so we have to use salt like calcium chloride uh, to, to promote the gelation of alginate. Whereas kappa carrageenan uh, would require, uh, for example, uh, potassium. Yeah, potassium to induce the gelation and some gel can form on uh, cooling which means that let's say we have agar so we boil it in water so it's already in, in the you know liquid form or melted form then we have to cool it down we have to cool it down uh, before it can form and set you know as a gel and in this category, we have gelatin, agar, and pectin as an example. But there is a small number of uh, hydrocolloids that can form gel on heating. The most common one, if you think about egg white, <coughs> egg albumin. So, you know, when we heat up, it will transform from transparent, you know, liquid into a white gel, opaque white gel. So what happens there is actually denaturation of the protein and it, you know from from liquid from sol it transforms into a, a gel form. So it's gel form a gel on heating. 
on the other hand, uh, and we have another example here, uh, which um, uh, the cellulose derivative, HPMC and MC, methyl cellulose and hydroxy propyl methyl cellulose, they can form a gel on heating, and this is uh, good for application where we can use MC or HPMC in the better formulation, you know, better formulation that we use to uh, coat the food uh, and we fry the food. So this, uh, during frying, the high temperature will transform the uh, HPMC or MC into gel and this gel will form a barrier or a layer to reduce the uh, absor absorption of oil into the food. So this is perhaps uh, very good to reduce the oil uh, consumption or oil absorption and reduce the fat content uh, of the food. Then uh, we have the non-gelling type, locust bean gum, xanthan, arabic, uh, also there's another one, gua gum. Yeah? Gua and locust bean gum always uh, we discuss together, they are, they are from seed. They are slightly different, but the, uh, they all can form a very viscous solution even at very low concentration, you know, around 1%, you can get a very viscous uh, solution and therefore, uh, they are mainly used as a stabilizing uh, agent or viscosifying uh, agent. So as you can see from um, this um, classification here, just now, uh, we, we it's, it's, more, it's very convenient if you, if you look at this uh, diagram just now to to see how the different uh, types of hydrocolloids are related to each other in terms of uh, the especially in terms of the application based on the, their properties whether they can form a gel or they, they can give uh, high viscosity and can be used as a stabilizer so that i think that's what all that i want to cover in this topic which basically in this lesson I focus on looking at how we classify the different types of food hydrocolloids based on the source of the raw material and also uh, based on the functional uh, properties. So once again, please go through the reading material that which I have provided uh, on the website and uh, in, the, in, the, in the class, in the next class, I will give you uh, some activities, uh, quizzes uh, so that we can go through. Uh, and I want to make sure that you know all the facts uh, correctly and also you understand how to uh, you know choose the right hydrocolloids, the right gums for certain specific application uh, in the food products. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye.